Hi, welcome to Jumpstart um, live online class. I think we are class 10 or so. Um, I sent an email to your parents explaining some things. Last week's uh, recording um, explaining uh, the, the, the video that has the um, the video that has how to grade the checklist challenge was in that same email. Uh, suggestions for next semester's live online class was in that email. So if you guys want to take research reports or essays or story writing or creative writing uh, next semester, uh, your parents will I got an email about that to get back in touch with me. And then um, it also had, um, can't remember what else it had. So anyway, your uh, parents got that email um, a few days ago. Oh, it also talked about how on Thanksgiving week, because of just the way, since we started a week later than the other classes locally, um, you guys will actually have a video on Thanksgiving week. Obviously, we won't meet on Thanksgiving Day, um, but you will have a video that week, and you can watch it anytime, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, the following Monday, um, and uh, so we will actually have seven weeks of classes left, including this one. All right, so some of the editing marks that you're going to notice on your paper. Uh, the first thing that I want you to be aware of, and we talked about this extensively when we talked about compound sentences. So the first one is this. And when you see a CS somewhere in your um, paper for a, an editing mark, what that means is that um, you either don't have a CS or you do. So it might say no CS or it might say CS. Either way, this stands for complete sentence. So uh, when you have a fragment or a subordinate clause or something used as a sentence, it will say no C, it'll say CS, no CS. That means fix that because that's not a complete sentence. Um, but another time or more often than not, a time that this is used is when you have something like, um, the girl um, spoke and sang with a comma before the and. And then what I will write above that will look like this. I will write CS, no CS. Okay. And then I will do this with my whirly gig, all right? And that means that you don't use a comma before the and because you don't have a complete sentence on the right-hand side. Remember to use a coordinated conjunction slash fanboys. In order to use that to combine two sentences into one, you comma for, comma and, comma nor, comma but, comma or, comma yet, comma so. You need a CS here and a CS here. So when you see any marking that says no CS, I'm telling you that you don't have a complete sentence, so you can't do whatever you did here. Another instance would be the same kind of thing where you say the girl spoke semicolon sang. This is a bad example because that would be too obvious. But, but um, in this case, I would say CS, no CS. So you can't use a semicolon there, right? Because the semicolon is used just like a comma for, comma and, comma nor, comma but, comma or, comma yet, comma so. It is used to combine two sentences into one. And this is no CS over here. This is not a complete sentence. So that is one mark that you'll see different times. You'll see me taking commas out. Um, and we haven't gone over all the, well, there, we're never going over every single solitary comma rule. But we haven't gone over uh, all of the comma rules for this class yet. So some of the times you might not know exactly why I took a comma out. A common reason that I would take a comma out is when people use a comma in the middle of their sentence before a subordinate clause, like um, I am cleaning my house, comma, because company is coming, all right? Or um, I am cleaning my house, comma, when I am done teaching. 
And a lot of people will use a comma there when they're getting ready to have a subordinate clause at the end of their sentence. And a comma is not needed before an ending subordinate clause unless it's a which clause. I'm cleaning my house, comma, which I hope uh, helps helps uh, uh, helps my guest to enjoy it more. All right, in that case, you would have a comma which. But other than that, subordinate clauses do not have commas before them. So you'll see that somewhere in your papers. They don't have commas before them when they're at the end of a sentence. Um, I'm trying to think of a couple of other examples of, um, it's mostly just the semicolons, the, the, the con combining two sentences into one. Um, sometimes once we start learning these rules, comma, for, comma, and, comma, nor, comma, but, comma, or, yet, comma, yet, comma, so, complete sentence, complete sentence between the two, or semicolon between the two, um, we get carried away. <laughs> so that will be marked there throughout your papers. Um, so anyway, those will be coming. Uh, you'll get uh, snapshots of the edits, and then you'll put those in and make final copies of everything that you get back from me. All right, okay. I'm going to move on over to old assignments. The last thing, the first thing that we had last week was the finishing up of the BHL verb song. And that was on 188. 188. And if you remember right, we talked a lot in story writing. We have two projects left after our biographical essay. One is a research report and one is a another story. Um, and uh, so the last three projects will be essay, research, story. So we'll get one of each of the main categories of writing. Um, so one of the main reasons that we said we needed to learn BHLs is so that we can substitute strong verbs in place of BHLs. And this is especially effective and needful in story writing, right? We all saw in your stories the predator and prey, how, you know, we don't just say the, um, the uh, bunny was uh, in the grass. We want to say what he's doing in the grass, right? And so that is one of the big uses that we want to be able to find BHLs and substitute for them. Now, when we are circling all of the verbs in the checklist challenge, when you do the complete checklist challenge, one of the first tasks will be to circle all the verbs. And when you are circling all of the verbs in the checklist challenge, you're going to circle BHLs, actions, and infinitives, two plus any verb. So that can be two plus an action or two plus a BHL. When you're circling all three main kinds of verbs all throughout your paper, then you're going back through your paper and substituting a strong verb throughout each paragraph once, one time in each paragraph, you can, you'll be able to spot those BHLs. You'll have all your verbs circled, but by memorizing the BHL verb song, you'll be just laser, oh yeah, that's, all, that's a BHL verb all by itself. I wanna change that. I can make that stronger, okay? Keep in mind when we substitute something for a BHL verb, we take out the BHL verbs that are alone, right? We're trying to get rid of that passivity. We're trying to get rid of the boringness of using BHLs, that of not having action, because action verbs are our forward motion. We do not take out BHL verbs that go with another verb that tell you when you did something. So that's why they're being, helping, and linking verbs. They're all three categorized together in one song, but we know that being verbs, linking verbs by themselves are the ones we want to change, and as helpers, we need them. We need helping verbs to tell when we did something. He was going. I have gone. You know, so that we don't want to take them out in those cases. So when you want to substitute for your BHLs, you are going to want to find the BHLs that are all by themselves. Just like we did in this assignment on 189. The robin's nest was soft. The lion was ferocious. The shark was a good swimmer. Those are the instances in which we want to get rid of the BHLs and put in strong verbs instead. All right, so the a helper link verbs is our am, was, and were, be, and being, been, become, has, and had, and have, are ones. Can, could, shall, should, they are fun, will, would, do, did, does, and done. May, might, must, they are some as well, appear, look, seem, remain, taste, feel, and smell. 
All right, I need to make a note of something here quickly. All right, so hopefully you guys finish memorizing that and you're able to spot them quickly when you do your checklist challenges. Let's keep on swimming over here to page 202. 202, this was working on um, transitions and sequencing. All right, super, super important in um, story writing, but also important in essay writing, as you probably found this week. When you are having three reasons, like you basically have in this week's kind of biographical slash beginning persuasive paper, when you are having three reasons, you want to signpost for your reader. You want to tell your reader where you're going, where you've been, how this is more information, how you are furthering your thought, how you are proving your idea, all right? And all of those things can be done with sequencing slash transition words. Now, in story writing, of course, you have a sequence of events throughout the story writing process that we did together with the calm and then the inciting incident and all of those. And that, that is super important for that. So that was on 203. You were supposed to list at least 10 more sequencing words, and then you were supposed to write five sentences using sequencing words. So if for some reason that isn't done, keep your sticky on that. All right, you sent your stories to me by yesterday at four o'clock. That is on 204. And uh, we are not doing the checklist challenge on that. Um, I think throughout the whole progression of story writing, the strong verbs, the transitions, and everything that we did throughout this unit, I think that um, we will be good to just do a final copy. So when you get that back from me, uh, you can mark it on here. If you sent this paper, some of you sent your three foods and some of you sent your story. So if you sent me your story, mark 205J1. So then that's going to take us out of that story writing, but we do have a story at the end that we're going to do, and this is going to be a person trying to get out of a situation. So it'll be similar, and it will still have the, the calm, the inciting incident, the buildup, and uh, the setting, and of course the main characters, the obstacles, and all of those things. But we'll do that uh, for our last project. All right, so on 259, um, we actually started our biographical paper. Well, we started looking at Cyrus. Um, the Conqueror and the Peacemaker. So let's go back over here to 252 first. Um, this was how we dissected 252. We had dissected the sample paper that was for us. And it was about Cyrus the Great, the man who created the Persian Empire in 550 BC. And um, did you guys outline or did you outline and write? You just outlined this week, right? You didn't write yet? Okay. All right. So let's just talk about some of these elements to be sure that um, you have all of those in your paper. On 252, we have an opening paragraph, again, that describes who he is. Uh, this particular paper, you are going to have an opening sentence and a closing sentence. Remember the 131 that we talked about earlier with essays? You can have... Uh, three paragraphs for your body. You can have an opening paragraph and a closing paragraph, and that makes five paragraphs. And that's what people traditionally think of when they think of a five paragraph essay. Um, but we call it the 131 because you're always going to go for three paragraphs for the body. And this is super important for students to not get in their heads that I'm always doing a five paragraph essay. I'm always doing a five paragraph essay because then when they're in a time situation, they start writing their opening paragraph and they put so much time and energy into that opening paragraph that their time is out before they get their paper done and they don't get their three paragraphs of the body, which are the most important elements in a five paragraph essay. So we call it the 131 because you're always shooting for three paragraphs for the body. 
And we started out by doing three, well, actually we started out earlier by doing three favorite foods, right? That was kind of a stepping stone to multi-paragraph writing. And then this time we did three reasons, three peaceable actions. But with the one, three, one, you can have those opening and closing paragraphs, or you could just have an opening sentence or two tacked on, that would be your thesis statement, tacked on to the beginning of the first paragraph, and then you could put a closing sentence tacked on to the end. But it's, we don't want to call it a three-paragraph essay because we don't want to get in the mindset that we don't need anything but those three paragraphs. We always need something at the beginning and something at the end. So those are our ones. One, three, one. Our one could be a paragraph. It could be a sentence or two. Our last one could be a paragraph. It could be a sentence or two. But we need something. Right now, when you are going to add, to tack on your opening sentence to the beginning of your paper, you're not going to make it a separate paragraph, right? We talked briefly about Octi, opening, closing, uh, content all the same, three or more sentences, and indented. A paragraph needs three or more sentences, unless it's dialogue. So we're not going to put it by itself. We're just going to tack it onto the beginning. All right, but in this uh, example, we have an opening paragraph uh, that is a, uh, an introduction to Cyrus. So this is kind of biographical in nature, informative. You know, when I talk about the different opening paragraph types and how I want you to write vari different varieties of opening paragraphs, uh, this would be a biographical slash informative. And then um, the closing paragraph would be um, a summary paragraph, summarizing the three reasons. All right, so let's look again at POBA. This is the first peaceable act. And we circled, and uh, hopefully those of you who missed that class were able to watch the video, we circled, rather than killing Astyages, and I'm not sure how to pronounce that, for what he had done to him, he spared him. And then we drew an arrow to the margin, and we wrote first peaceable act. So your first paragraph of your body that you outlined this week should have your first peaceable act in it listed and then a description or a retelling of that act in your outline. Okay, POBB is paragraph three for the whole paper since this is a five paragraph sample. Uh, we circled rebuild the temple with his own money, once again showing even that a conqueror can display peaceable actions. Arrow to the margin, second peaceable action. And then in POBC, paragraph of body C, paragraph four, we have this cylinder is known as the first declaration of human rights. Arrow to the margin, third peaceable action. All right, and then we talked about how this fits in with our train. Um, let's go over to, well, let's just flip to 259 first. All right, this is a formal essay. And even though it's your opinion that your person is a peaceable person, you're still not going to say, I think so-and-so is a peaceable person. I think he showed this by these actions. You're still not going to do that, all right? You are going to instead talk in the third person the whole time. Last week, we circled in the third person writing box on 259. We circled the person, the individual, the man, the woman, the officer, people, etc. So you don't ever want to say, I think. You want to put forth the uh, supposition that your person is a peaceable person, and you're going to tell the three reasons, which are the three actions, and then you're going to tell the actions, the retelling, narrative, background to it, whatever of those three actions in such a way that your reader is convinced that your person is a peaceable person without you saying, I think he is, I think he showed it when he did this, and so forth. You want to put it forth as fact and then let your telling of it be the, re be the, um, the thing that prompts the person to believe that your person is peaceable. All right, so no first person. So do not use I or anything in a formal first person essay. All right, unlike the three foods, because those were your favorite foods, all right, then we wrote in first person. All right, over here on 260, we were changing 
the first person sentences provided below into third person ones using the words people, person, man, men, woman, women, individuals, etc. So some examples of this, um, I called Cyrus an ideal king. We want, don't want I. So we could say his enemies called Cyrus an ideal king. Or Cyrus's enemies called him an ideal king. Or the people of that day called him an ideal king. Number two, I made peace with all. Cyrus made peace with all. Now, this brings up an interesting point. If you're quoting somebody and they say I, then you can use it, of course. All right. Because you would have said Cyrus once said, comma, quote. Or Cyrus was once quoted as saying, comma, quote. All right. But um, and otherwise you don't. Number three, I allowed them to return to their homeland. Cyrus allowed them to return to their homeland. Number four, I granted everyone religious freedom. He or Cyrus granted everyone religious freedom. And number five, I respected my king as a father. Uh, the people respected their king as a father. Okay. So we want to be sure that we're not using first person. Okay, then we looked at the train analogy on 262 and um, uh, 263. All right, the, um, uh, question and answer, who was Cyrus, was the opening. That is the engine, the first thing that people see when it comes down the track. Then we had three train cars, three paragraphs for the body. POBA was the wheat car, child, child and adult with the, ma the meads. POBB was the corn car, controlling the Middle East. POBC was the bean car, Cyrus's decree. All right, and then the closing was a summary views of Cyrus. All right, that takes us over to your outline. Your next homework assignment was 285 when you were supposed to have your out, create your outline. All right, let's look back at the overview box. Remember the overview box on 277? I put a big sticker so I could find it easily. This is, this, this is a project that we're in the middle of right now. And um, I have it marked that you're doing three paragraphs for the body. Roman numeral three, six to eight sentences per paragraph. And then we're not going to do an opening. We're going to do an opening sentence or thesis statement. We're not going to do a closing paragraph. We're going to do a thesis statement reloaded. And you have to have one quote. All right. So hopefully you found a quote to include in your paper. Let's go ahead and did you have a brainstorming box to Okay. Let's go ahead back to 280. And if you're comfortable, let's give your thesis statement reloaded on 280. And then on 281, let's give your three peaceable actions. All right, 280, your working thesis statement. And 281, your three peaceable actions. Uh, you can just give the list. Uh, you don't have to tell the story. You can just say his first action was this, his second piece of action was this, the third piece of action is that. All right, Jordan, is it okay if I start with you on 280? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I had you muted. Okay. Uh, I actually, I didn't do the working thesis statement. I still got to do that. But my three peaceable acts is the person I did mine on was Chief Joseph. And the first one is Chief, Chief Joseph never allowed any violence against the whites or the soldiers and the settlers. And the second one is um, Chief, Chief Joseph called a council among his people. He spoke on the behalf of peace, preferred to abandon his father's land over war. And then the third one is uh, Chief Joseph spoke against the injustice of the U.S. government. Very well done. All right. And um, with the thesis statement, uh, because you only have three things, Okay, you can go ahead and include those in your thesis statement, like it's done on 280 if you want. And you can do them by enumerating them, like the sample, because one, he pushed for, push for religious freedom for Jews and Catholics, semicolon two, he would not become a dictator, 
semicolon, and three, he kept America out of war when he was president. Okay, this is an unusual use for a semicolon um, just because we are, have enumeration and we have uh, phrases that are like really complete sentences in there. All right, you could do it that way or you could just put because he pushed for religious freedom for Jews and Catholics, comma, would not become a dictator, comma, and kept America out of war. So you can do it right, with commas or with semicolons. You do semicolons, make them complete sentences, just like we talked about the CS. If you don't want to use commas, just uh, do he at the beginning because he did this, comma, this, comma, and this without repeating he every time. All right. Okay. How about you, Jack? Are you good to go on that? Um, yes. Great. Great. Um, my thesis statement for this essay was uh, Thomas Jefferson was a man of many accomplishments. And my... Okay three peaceful actions where he wrote the Declaration of Independence. He uh, made the uh, Louisiana purchase from the French while uh, the French were in war. Good. And the third peaceable action, he prohibited uh, slave trade. Very good. Very peaceable actions, right? And, and so, you know, the more you can um, beef up like kind of like what Jack did there that he'll he'll have a lot of material to be able to prove the peaceableness of Thomas Jefferson because of the things he did that were so compelling like during wartime or um, you know the, the the slave trade stuff like that he will have good information for that um, also in your uh, working thesis statement you want to be sure to everybody make a note on 280 to include the word Peaceable, peacemaker, promoter of peace, etc. Whatever works there in your thesis statement. Okay? Well done, Jack. How about you, Stuart? Are you ready for us? Oh. For my sorry. statement, I had. John Adams was a peaceful man because he helped in the war. He signed the Declaration of Independence and he negotiated a treaty with Paris. Good. Very good. And so he already has his peaceable actions in his thesis statement. So uh, were you able to find, uh, let me see, did you guys, you already did you research about those? So you have your, on your, in your box on 281, you have that first action listed, and then the second one and the third one that you just had in your thesis statement? I get to the box. Okay. Keep your sticky on that and um, uh, do that before you outline. All right. Good job. All right. And Adam. Uh, I had my, I said for Ed Abraham Lincoln was born a poor farm boy, and yet somehow he preserved the Union during the Civil War, helped push the Emancipation Proclamation of Slaves, and had the Gettysburg Address. Well done. Uh, and those are your three actions in your box on 281. That's the thesis statement. Uh -huh, but those are also the actions that you yeah. have. Great. Very well done. That's a good thesis. Okay, good, guys. Let's keep swimming over here. We are over here on um, two... 82. All right. Uh, the best papers are, uh, with quotes, are the ones that you put your quotes in as you outline. Okay. What that means is that you sometimes, uh, when an assignment says that you're going to have a quote in your paper, uh, a lot of times my students will outline their paper and write their paper, and then they'll go back and they'll stick a quote in. All right. And, um, Sometimes you can, I can tell that they stuck the quote in a little bit later, right? I can tell that they just put it in here at the end because they needed a quote or they were assigned to add a quote, all right? And so my preference is that students always, whenever they have a quote assignment, that to, to include one or more quotations, is that they put it in during the outlining stage. That I would rather have you guys put in your quote uh, on your outlining lines and even if you just say, you know, quote, and then you have it printed off, 
from the computer or whatever, or you made a copy of a book and you highlighted it and you included it with your outline. And this is the reason, because a quote in a paper, especially one that's semi-persuasive, should be in that paper because you want to tell your reader th something that is significant that you can't say without a quote. And your quote should be so compelling that it is needed. And not only is your quote so compelling that it is needed, but it's so compelling that it's needed right here. In other words, you're outlining and you're working along and you're just like, that quote is perfect here. That quote makes my point. That quote helps me tell my story. That quote helps me persuade my reader. That quote is needed. Okay, so the, the goal is going to be, especially um, in your last pa your next last paper, your research report about a weather phenomenon, your goal is going to be find your quotes ahead of time while you are outlining. So let's go through some quotation work on pages 282 and 283, and let's take out um, a couple of colors of highlighter that are not your homework color for this week. And we're going to walk through the punctuation of quotations. Um, I do have some blog posts about this. You can tell your parents if they want you to get more help. Um, I have blog posts with videos about this at my blog, um, which is Character Inc. blog. All right. Okay. So the first one on page 282 is, uh, well, let's assign this as a homework assignment too. So let's come here to 282 and assign C as a homework assignment. So you'll go back through and re- study these quotes uh, for homework before you write your paper. All right, and so what that means is that you'll do kind of what we're doing just as a review um, if you need help, if, you, if you're not 100% um, confident in your quote writing, okay? All right, and quotes are very, very, very tricky. So when you give me this paper um, later on and you get it back and I have fixed all of your quotes with my purple pen, um, do not think that that means that your paper is bad, all right? Quotation use and the punctuation of them is so tricky. I mean, I, out of everything that I see online in the online world, bloggers, even real articles by, I mean, articles by companies and so on and so forth, quotations are almost always done incorrectly. And I, I don't want to discourage you and, you know, have you not try to aspire to writing well with quotes, but I also don't want you to not do it because you don't want me to mark up your paper or you don't really think you remember how or it's too complicated. All right. So I want you to know I'm going to fix them for you. And it's and and I and it's, as long as you've studied and you've tried to do your quotes, then then that's all I ask of you. All right. So here we go at the bottom of 282. A basic quote was speech tag at the beginning. A wise person once said, all right, circle that. That is your speech tag. Circle that with your first color. That is your speech tag. All right, and a speech tag is the tag that indicates who is doing the speaking. So who is saying that quote? And when we talk about a beginning speech tag, we're talking about a speech tag that comes before your quote. All right, beginning speech tag. All right, and so it tags the speaker, speech tag. All right, now with another color, highlight the comma, and then the quote, and then the capital I with that same color. All right, when you have a beginning speech tag, we're going to just use commas right now following beginning speech tags. Um, maybe we'll get into colons, but that's really in some of the, like the upper essay book and the upper research book. Um, because a colon can only follow a speech tag if it's a complete sentence. So rather than trying to figure out, should I put a colon, should I put a comma, for right now, let's just put commas. All right, so we have a speech tag, beginning of the sentence starts with a capital, just like a sentence does. A wise person once said, comma. All right, your speech tag has, at the beginning, has to have a comma following it before the actual quote. All right, then we have quote, and that's a double quote. We never use singles, okay? Singles are only to be used inside doubles. It's a completely different rule and completely done incorrectly everywhere. All right, capital I. Now, we have to put a capital letter at the beginning of a quote, no matter where it falls, if it was, if it was a complete sentence. 
all right? And students get tricked, tripped up by this because they think, that, well, I already have a capital, all right? And that's true. Your sentence always starts with a capital letter. But we're going to start all complete sentence quotations with a capital letter, even though that means we have two capitals. All right, it's still this part of the same sentence, but it is a quote. So quote, capital I. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Get another collar and highlight the period quote. All right, now this is interesting because we have Jordan, who is from Canada. He's from BC. And Jordan, I am not sure, and maybe I don't know if you know this or not, but in uh, England and other countries, periods are inside, outside quotation marks. Um, how about you, Jordan? Do you know how uh, it's what the rule is there? No idea. Absolutely no idea. Okay, <laughs> so you can do it the USA way. <laughs> I, um, the, the way you'll know, Jordan, is if you read a Canadian author from a real book, don't go online and try to figure it out because people don't do it right. Uh, a Canadian author from a, in a real book, um, if the periods are in the in, inside of the quotation marks, then he does. Then Canada does it like the U.S. I know in Europe, and I know like uh, if you go to a museum and they have a traveling display. Like we just were at one that had a traveling display from Switzerland and all the periods were outside the quotation marks. Um, but in the USA, we put periods inside. So let's circle, highlight that, draw an arrow to the margin that says periods always go inside, unless you're somewhere else. <laughs> periods always go inside quotation marks. All right, so that is a perfectly done quote with a beginning speech tag. All right, let's go to quote number two at the top of 283. Uh, with your first caller, highlight quote capital I. Quote, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, comma, quote, said a wise person. All right, we have our quotation mark that comes at the beginning. This one is a speech tag at the end, just like it's uh, um, labeled at the top of the box on 283. So we call this an ending speech tag. That means the speech tag is gonna come after the quote. So you can do your quote either way. You can do it with the beginning speech tag or you can do it with an ending speech tag. All right, and they're punctuated differently. The beginning speech tag is the one that I always start out with in teaching younger students. Um, and we just do that for a while because that is the simplest version of it um, because you don't have to worry about what I'm about to tell you about with this one, uh, the comma. So here we go. Second caller, comma, quote, lowercase s. All right. The speech tag, let's go ahead with the third caller and uh, circle the speech tag at the end. Set a wise person. All right. Now, comma, quote, lowercase s. We have three or four things going on here, so I'm going to go a little slow. Um, slower than I sometimes do when I sound like an auctioneer, all right? Okay, comma, quote, draw an arrow to the margin. Commas always go inside quotation marks. In the U.S., commas and periods are always inside the uh, quotation mark, okay? Never on the outside. There's never a time that you examine it and say, well, it's part of the quote, it's not part of the quote. It's always inside. That's one thing we can count on. There are so many grammar and usage rules that we can't count on that are confusing, right? But with the um, uh, commas and periods, they always go inside quotation marks. So that is super, super helpful. Um, then. The other thing that we have to look at is that we have a comma and not a period. Over here we have, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, period. But at the top of 283, we have, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again, comma. All right, so with a fourth or fifth or sixth collar, circle the comma, circle the period after person, draw an arrow to the margin from both of those, and write a sentence can only have one period. A sentence can only have one period. Okay, this 
rule for a comma, quote, then speech tag can be summed up in the sentence, a sentence can only have one period. All right, now that is used as an end mark, used as a period, because we know that we put periods, if we put U period S period for US, U period S period A, if you put period, if you put Mr., Mrs., Doctor, all right, but we're talking about a period used as an end mark. So we cannot put a period quote and then set a wise person period with an ending speech tag. Right. Have you ever tried it before in a word processing program, Word or Microsoft Word or whatever, WordPad, and you put try, try again, period, quote, what happens to your speech tag? It makes it a capital S. So that can be a little clue. It only works if it's not a proper noun, if your speech tag doesn't start with a proper noun. A little clue can be if I put a period after try again, period, quote, my set is gonna be capped. You don't wanna cap your speech tag. So because a sentence can only have one period, we put a comma following the quote before the ending speech tag. I know it's super confusing. It's like, this is a comma, this is a period, you know, so on and so forth. That's why I'm only doing these two rules today. But the, the comma goes inside the, um, Quotation mark, no period. Now, the uh, problem that we can have with that comes with page 284. Let's flip over to that one now. This is also a speech tag at the end. So let's circle the speech tag with our first caller, ask Charlie Brown. Where have I gone wrong? Ask Charlie Brown. Okay, we have an ending speech tag again. Starts with the lowercase letter, because we don't start speech tags in the, in the middle or the end of the sentence with a capital. All right, let's highlight quote, capital W. All quotations start with a capital letter. Another color, question mark, quote, ask Charlie Brown. I said on the previous page, that a sentence can only have one period used as an end mark, but it can have a question mark and a period, or an exclamation point and a period. And so in this case, we can put a question mark, quote, and then a period at the end, All right? So we don't need a comma here since it's a question. So summing up, if it's a statement, with an ending quotation mark, we put comma, quote, speech tag. If it is a question or an exclamatory sentence, we put those marks, quotation mark, closing speech tag. And our um, asked is lowercase, so let's do that with the third color. Highlight asked, that's the beginning of your speech tag. And your period, highlight that in another color at the end, is for your whole sentence. That includes your speech tag and your quote. So when you have a statement, like over here on 283, you're going to have comma, quote, lowercase speech tag, and then a period at the end of that. When you have a question, like the top of 284, you're going to go ahead and put your question mark in, and then your quotation mark, and then your lowercase speech tag, and then your period at the end for the whole sentence. All right, let's mark the exclamatory sentence in the same way. Start with your first collar at the top of 285. At the top of 285. Quotation, capital W. Watch out, he exclaimed. Quotation capital W, because all quotes start with capitals, unless they're partial quotes, and then we use dot, dot, dot. We won't worry about that today. All right, then highlight exclamation point, quotation mark. Then circle your speech tag, he exclaimed. And then highlight your H, Draw an arrow to the margin at ending speech tag 
equals lowercase. Okay, that's the same way all the way. It doesn't matter if that is a declarative sentence like a statement or a question or an exclamatory sentence. All right, now that is not the case, obviously, if we had said, um, like, where have I gone wrong? Charlie Brown asked. Then we wouldn't lowercase Charlie, right? Because that's a proper noun. That's another, another rule supersedes this rule in that case. All right, so periods and commas always inside. Top of 284, question mark is inside. Top of 285, exclamation point is inside. And that is because they're part of the quote. All right, so we'll get into more quotation rules when we add quotes to our research paper. Um, uh, and next week we're actually starting that. And um, figure out when a question mark will be inside, when a question mark will be outside. But for right now, if you have a quote by a person in your biographical paper, and it has an ex exclamation point or a question mark in it where you lifted it out of the book to put it in your paper, you'll put that in and it'll go inside. All right. Um, our sample back here on um, uh, 2... 852. Let's look at the quotes in here. The, the quotes in here are um, mostly for special words, but we can still see the punctuation of them. So come here to 252. And in the first paragraph, highlight the quotation mark before a father and after a father. All right. These quotation marks in this paper are not for quotes. You're going to add one quote to your paper this week. These are for special words, all right? And this is where people really mess up with the singles and the doubles because they'll be like going, oh, it's small, so I'll use a single. Or it's not a full quote, so I'll use a single. Or it's not a quotation, it's a special word, so I'll use a single. You never use singles unless they're inside doubles. And that's a way, way, way more advanced skill that we'll do later um, in another class. But Quote, a father, double quotes always, all right? And there's no capitalization or anything like that because all this is doing is pointing out special words, all right? Then let's do the same thing with, quote, ideal king, period, quote. Quote, ideal king, period, quote. And then draw an arrow to your margin from that period, quote, and write, a sentence can only have, oh no, not there, write, um, sorry about that, period, inside, quotation mark, write that there, period, inside, quotation mark, okay, again, in the U.S., it doesn't matter whether it's part of the quote, whether it is a, a quoted special word, whether it's a quotation from a person, periods and commas are always inside, so you'll put that right inside there, all right, Let's go on down to paragraph, um, well, I guess the closing paragraph is the next time that there's a quote. And it is, quote, the, uh, quote, the, quote, chosen king, unquote. And then the same thing with, quote, father, unquote, fo, quote, ideal king, unquote. Okay, all three of those are special quotes. So you think about people using air quotes, you know how annoying people are, and they do this all the time. All right, that's basically what this is. These are the air quotes, right? They're just showing special situations. But the punctuation is still the same. Periods and commas, if you have them, always go inside. All right, so let's flip on over and see where this puts us in our um, paper for this week. The, the paper we're starting now. Uh, on second thought, let's go ahead and do these last two, on 283 and uh, 284. All right, Charlie Brown asked, circle that, that's your speech tag, the bottom of 283. All right, this is a quote with the speech tag at the beginning, uh, a question quote. All right, Charlie Brown asked, okay, that's your speech tag, highlight comma, quote, capital W. All Quotations start with a capital letter, unless they're 
air quotes or something. All right, comma, quote, capital W. Where have I gone wrong? Then at the end, highlight the question mark, quotation mark. Draw an arrow to your margin that says question marks Go inside if part of the quote. Question marks go inside if part of the quote. All right, and so that is, it's a question. He's asking a question, where have I gone wrong? So the question mark goes inside. All right, the um, commas and periods are always inside. Question marks are if they belong if, there, if it's a question sentence. All right, and then page 284, at the bottom, circle the speech tag. He exclaimed, highlight, comma, quote, capital W. Quotations always begin with a capital letter. All right, with another color, Highlight, exclamation point, quote, arrow to the margin, exclamation, and you can just put E-X-C-L-A-M or whatever helps you, exclamation points, go inside if part of quote. Now, I know all this stuff that I'm having you write in the margins is written down below in the details of the rule, okay? And, but this will help you when you study it again. You'll be going, oh, yeah, I remember when I wrote that. She was talking about how the exclamation points and the question marks go inside when they're part. All right, I know it's all detailed out for you because I spent a year and a half on quote cards for my books. It took forever to because there, there are tons of them. There are pages and pages and pages of them. These are the basic ones, all right? So you are going to have one quote. So over here on page 286 is where you started your out, where you wrote your outline for this week. So if you don't have your quote yet in your outline, put a note here that says add one quote on 286 and put this week's color on if you don't already have one. So look at your three reasons and look at your um, retelling of that action and see if a quote would fit and where it would fit, all right, and why you would want to use it. Now, for this essay, you only need one. So your quote can either be something that somebody said about him. So suppose um, Stewart had a, uh, in his paragraph about, um, what was your last paragraph about freeing the slaves, Stewart? Thomas Jefferson, right? Are you Thomas Jefferson? Are you Thomas? No? Okay. Who had Thomas Jefferson? I did. Jack? Okay. All right. So your um, last paragraph was about him freeing the slaves, right? Uh, no. It's about him uh, prohibiting uh, slave trade. Oh, slave trade. Okay, good. Okay. So, so he could put a quote by Thomas Jefferson that he said about the slave trade. All right? Or he could put something that somebody said about Thomas Jefferson prohibiting the slave trade. It doesn't have to be by your person. It just has to be by or about your person and about whatever your reason was, whatever your peaceable action was. Okay? Only one this time. You'll have an opportunity to put a lot more in in your next paper. All right? So let's just start with one here and put it anywhere that it fits, either about your person or by your person. All right, so let's look at the outline on 286 and 287. Keep this new sticky note on if you don't have a quote yet. Here we go. You had your first peaceable action. That was on 286, topic of POBA. You have your second peaceable action, topic of POBB. You have your third peaceable action, topic of POBC. All right, and then you had your link transition and then your SSs, your support sentences, all the way through on your outlining lines, right? Now, when you are going from one thing to another, 
you haven't done, you've kind of written your working thesis statement, but you don't have your first sentence. What you're going to do when you write this is you're going to start right in with your first peaceable action. All right. We save the final thesis statements in the case of a thesis statement we're attacking on or the opening paragraph for after we write the body. And the reason is because we always do the thesis statement first. So you know what you're studying, what you're writing about, you're narrowing your topic and all of that but we don't write the opening paragraph because the opening paragraph is for your reader. Your thesis statement is for you. Your thesis statement is to tell me what I'm writing about, okay? What I'm supposed to research, what I'm supposed to find, what I'm going to include. My thesis statement is for me, but your, an opening paragraph is for your reader. So we always save the opening paragraph for later after the body is written, so you, have, you know how you can entertain the reader, how you can pull the reader into your paper, how you can interest the reader, all right? So we always save that for later. So we're gonna start out writing this week for this paper on 286. You're gonna start out writing by going right into your uh, first peaceable action. And so you might say something like, the first action or, or not the first, it wouldn't be the, his very first action, but uh, a, a peaceable action, the, a first peaceable action that Thomas Jefferson did was blank. One way that Thomas Jefferson showed that he was a peaceable man was blank. The first way that Thomas Jefferson was a peacemaker was blank. Okay, and that's going to be this link slash transition. All right, then the top of 287 link transition. Another way uh, Chief Joseph showed peace or proved his peaceableness, is that a word? All right, was blank. And then you have the whole paragraph to retell it, the whole paragraph to uh, prove your guys peaceable, right? And then the third one, the same thing. A third way that, um, can't remember who everybody's writing about. A third way that Chief Joseph was peaceable was when he blank. All right, so let's go over to the actual writing assignment for that. That is on 288, 288E. So, so far you have final copies of anything that I send you. Um, including your story, and then on this 288, and I'm gonna, just going to put in the margin because once you start doing multiple papers, remember it gets tricky, so you might have a final copy of your three favorite foods if I just received the rough draft of that. You might have, you should have your final copy of your story if I received the rough draft of that. So this one is going to be um, right rough draft three, Peaceable actions. It says at the top, original biographical. So it's biographical. It's a biographical essay, biographical in nature, but you're focusing on three areas of his three things that he did. All right. So you're going to do just what I just talked about when I walked through the outline. Okay. You're going to come over there and um, get your first uh, topic sentence. Your write your support sentences, then go to your link for the next one, drop down to your next paragraph, and so forth. All right, that takes us over to 289. 289, highlight F1 and F2. Right, I said we're not going to have a separate opening paragraph. Instead, we're going to just tweak those thesis statements and tack them onto the front of paragraph one. All right, so you can do something like a question have you ever thought of cyrus the great as a man who promoted peace and then your thesis cyrus the great was peaceable because he enlist your three you can have a non-sentence i'm giving you permission right sparing his enemy helping people rebuild granting religious freedom these three peaceable acts were carried out by cyrus the great two sentences instead of one thesis statement so two one president still tacked on one president who promoted peace was George Washington. He pushed for religious freedom for Jews and Catholics. He would not become a dictator, and he kept um, America out of war when he was president. 
All right, so outline it here or whatever and get your clean, perfect one right down here on 289. All right, then we're going to do the same thing at the end. Thesis statement reloaded. 290, G1, G2. Write your closing sentence or sentences to be attached to the last paragraph of your body. And there's a sample there. Thesis statement reloaded with a different version of your opening sentence. For example, if your opening was sparing his enemy, helping people rebuild, granting religious freedom, these three peaceful acts were carried out by Cyrus the Great, you could close with, yes, Cyrus, the Great, Cyrus spared his enemies, help people rebuild, and granted religious freedom. Or you could ask a question challenging the reader, and this is when you would switch to second person, just for a sec. Don't you agree that um, sparing, the, sparing an enemy Helping people rebuild and granting religious religious freedoms are peaceable actions. All right? Get your perfect one right here and then attach them to your paper. And the last homework assignment for today is 291H. So with this, you are going to do the checklist challenge on your three paragraphs. So let me find the page number and we'll look at it together in just a sec. All right, so right here beside H, I'm gonna put an arrow to the margin that says, on three peaceable acts, CC equals 294 plus. Like I said many, many, many times, once you get into the class and you have multiple papers, I like to just indicate things in the margins. So it's like, okay, that's the final of my story. All right, this is the out, uh, this is the writing of the peaceful actions. Okay, this is a checklist challenge on peaceful actions. Okay, study skills. You guys want to get really good at those. All right, so let's go over to 294. And uh, let's take out on 294, let's take out the second task and the third task. I feel like you guys are pretty much beyond finding out whether a complete sentence is a complete sentence or not. And I feel like you guys are also beyond your paragraphs. You know what a paragraph contains and the outline, of course, also narrows the margin. You can't really, you can't talk about the second peaceable action in the first paragraph because of the way the outline is laid out, right? Tricked you, didn't I? All right. So then uh, there are three boxes for all of these recurring tasks. That means that you're going to do each one one time per paragraph. So all, 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 that means everybody is doing that task in each paragraph. Circle each verb. So everybody's doing that. The top of 295, change a boring verb, add an adverb, add a descriptive adjective. At the bottom of 295, create a title. Okay, there are some examples there. You don't have to use any of those if you don't want, but they're there if you need them. All right, now at this point, let's take out a light colored highlighter. I'm gonna grab a yellow here. And at the bottom of 295 is when it starts saying, if you have already done this, you should still code the CC box and the title in your paper as directed by your teacher. So what that means is that um, even if you've already ha done the rest of these things that are in the checklist challenge, you're still gonna code them so that your grader can look and see, okay, I see the three sentence openers, I see the new title, I see the thesis statement, I see the thesis statement reloaded. Even if it's already there, you code what is there. You don't have to redo it, but you have to code it. All right, that also comes over here at 296, the top. If you do not have any band words, just code, just put check, check marks in the boxes, and your grader will know that you didn't have any band words that you couldn't find any and that you look for them, right? Okay, all right, and then the next one down on 296, if you have already done this, you should still code the boxes. The next one down, if you've already done this, you should still code the boxes. This is the point where you're gonna add the thesis and the thesis reloaded. It's just, the, the checklist challenge is just double checking that you have that, all right? All right, then the bottom of 296, if you've already done this, you should still code the CC boxes and these words in your paper. All right, 297, if your transition sentences are adequate, you should still code them. 
Okay, you should have one transition sentence at the beginning of paragraph two and one transition sentence at the beginning of paragraph three. Next one, if you've already done the SSS5, code it. Next one, if you already, if your teacher thinks your vocabulary is advanced enough, uh, you can just check those, find your, find your sophisticated words. If you've already done the al adverb that does not modify a verb, code it. If you do not have any redundancy, check it off so your teacher knows. My guess is that you'd be really hard pressed in a biographical type of essay to not have redundancy, right? How many times do we have Cyrus in our paper? We need to change that to great king, conqueror, whatever. All right, the next page, 298, everybody is doing sentence openers. Everybody is doing a coordinating conjunction, creating a compound that we've had a lot. And everybody is doing a semicolon with a compound. And everybody is doing our double descriptive adjectives. Now, all, everything on 298 and 299, they all say, if you've already done this, code it. So you can find your semicolon. Go ahead and put it in when you write. Put that comma for, comma yet. Write when you write, and then just find it and code it later. It's better when you do it when you write, much better. It's much more fluid. All right? Everybody know what you're doing? Okay. All right, see you next Thursday. Call me, text me, knock on my door if you need me. See ya.